let's get started on my little boy's shirt. Uh, I would suggest you watch the introduction where you see uh, what I use, how the pattern goes together and all of that sort of thing. For this shirt, I'm using a heavier weight cotton. It's still a quilting cotton, but it's heavier weight, lightweight for the contrast and also some iron-on interfacing to firm up collars, etc. 10 or 12 buttons, depending on whether you put a button on the tab and also some matching thread. We begin by interfacing everything that needs to have a bit more stand. And I'm interfacing here the cuffs. You need to do that twice. And if you're using a contrast fabric, the outside of the cuff, the share fabric has to be interfaced. On the collar stand, if you're using a contrast fabric, you would want the shell to be interfaced and the contrast uh, is going to just stay as it is. For the collar, if you are using a contrast, you want to put the interfacing onto the contrast, not the shell. And on this particular one, I'm actually doing the collar in the same fabric, so it doesn't matter which one I put it on. I worked actually two shirts and filmed one and then showed everything on the other one. Then you can iron a strip of interfacing down the front as indicated by the dashed lines. But in fact, if you're using a heavier fabric like I did, I peeled it back off because it was just too thick. Then you fold over and you uh, iron just where you've got the snip for the pleat. And then you can iron that over again. I've actually measured it, but uh, you can just do it uh, by the seat of your pants really. It needs to be 3.2 centimeters across. And if you open that out and you now put the pleat mark from which we've ironed onto the other pleat mark and iron that, you will see that the uh, inside fits right into that little gap. If you're not sure how that works, please watch the introduction to the pattern again. Now we've also going to top stitch this. And I'm going to pin this to make sure that the underneath, which is like the facing really, doesn't slip out. That's quite important. Once I've done that, I can top stitch it with a triple stitch. If you're making the shirt for a bigger boy, I would recommend not the triple stitch. Just use a longer stitch length and a normal thread or an embroidery thread. That's also good, a thicker type of thread but definitely no triple stitch because the stitches are a bit smaller and so on a small shirt that looks really cute on a big shirt that will just look homemade. So we're going down either side and I'm using those red lines on my puff machine. And now we're going to make the pockets. The first thing to do is to overlock all the way around the pocket. You can lift the presser foot as well, just move it around. It is not necessary to overlock this pocket, you could just leave it, but um, I like it nice and clean look, so I do that. Now we're going to iron over the edge, and that's really uh, it's not a centimeter i do slightly less i always do that and then where the snip is we turn it over and we iron that down if you have a fabric that's the same inside and out of course you could have the tip to the outside but now we're going to um, sew it from the outside so in order to know where we're sewing we're going to just iron in a little crease on both sides and that tells us where we actually have to uh, sew this along. So I'm going to put a few pins in. Maybe you want to mark the center because sometimes when it's under the sewing machine, you actually don't see where the center is all of a sudden. But if you can see those crease marks well enough, then line that up with your little red line on your sewing machine if you've got a foot like mine. And 
when you get to the center move it around and then go back up to the other side now we're going to put a gather thread that will help us get this nice and round So you can see I'm stitching directly on the edge of the overlocking. Now I'm also going to make a little template. It is not necessary. The ones of you with more experience won't have to do that. But if you are a beginner, then I would suggest that yes, make yourself a template. One centimeter seam allowance, fold it in half, and then we're cutting it a bit slimmer so that we can fit the pocket around it and iron along it. fold in the top edge so you can see exactly where it needs to go turn over your pocket and then put your template on there I tend to iron the sides first or not use a template at all so that's up to you I think I would just do one pocket like this and then you come up with your own way of how you want to do this but the important part now is when you're taking the template back out you can pull the gather thread mind only from one side and it pulls in that corner so it's nice and round and that gives you a perfect edge so you could just use the overlocking as your guide and just fold it over slightly more or you can put the template in obviously and make sure that both pockets are exactly the same by just ironing around that one and that gives you perfect finish and I think for a beginner everyone will say "Ooh, how did you do that and you say oh yeah mum's the word I know how so now the pocket is done we can place it onto our shirt and it actually needs to go where the curve of the armhole is it's just about two centimeters higher than that point there and from the plucket I've got it one and a half centimeters across so but it's actually just a little bit of um, doing it by eye and maybe having a look at another shirt you've got seeing ah oh, that's where it needs to sit so you can now just do it by eye side or measure it and put it on the other side or put this pocket on upside down and then the other piece on top of that and then you can pin through this and that should give you the position and then if you have to adjust it a couple of millimeters you just have to do that and it'll sit just right so if you pull this apart you can see that sits uh, not quite right I've adjusted it a tiny little bit and that's perfect so I'm going to pin this as well Make sure that nothing stands out of the edge and now we're going to top stitch a corner into this so we're going across first and then up so you need to aim for the end of the overlocking where it's turned in that's about the right distance and on my machine it is then three stitches over so it goes forwards backwards forwards forwards backwards forwards and forwards backwards forwards again then turn and you go all the way around you have to hold your fabric fairly steady because it does like to push a bit when you do this um, triple stitch have the needle down when you turn the fabric that's important and here's the other corner and actually I've speeded up this footage so just think how slowly even I do this if I want it to be really really nice I do take my time then go all the way up to about the same point as on the other side and then we're going to go across again with our three stitches and down and secure your thread and the pockets are done I think they look really stunning really nice technique very round at the bottom and it can fray or rip out at the top now we're going to do the back put your pleats in first and the pleats face the outside
Now we're going to sandwich that back between the two yolks. So the outside yolk goes in first, right sides facing the outside, and the inside yolk also now fa faces the other yolk part, and so the back sandwiched in between. Then we pin that across, put both on, and then we're using a one centimeter seam allowance all the way across to stitch this into place. And this has sandwiched it in really nice and it's super and clean. Stick to the seam allowance, that's ever so important on all these things because it all adds up if you don't take the right seam allowance and by the time you put your sleeve in it's actually really difficult to get it in if you have taken too much. Next you're going to iron up the back like that and once you've ironed that bit you turn the other one up and you iron that one up. And I've done that now so it's beautifully sandwiched in here. But because I'm using a really thick fabric, I'm going to cut back my contrast. And that makes it a bit flatter before I top stitch. Now we're going to top stitch along the edge and I'm using my triple stitch again that I really like. And if you're doing it for a bigger boy, I would use a longer stitch length all the way along and then do another stitch along it foot width. Now we're going to do the shoulders. Put the shoulders right sides facing together and then we're going to sew this across with foot width seam allowance, not a centimeter, just foot width. And the reason for this is because of course we're going to sandwich in again the yoke in the contrast fabric. Um, and we're doing this because we're using the contrast fabric to sandwich again the front into the yoke. So if you turn the contrast around, you can also pin that too and everyone that's got lots of experience, they will just do this in one step and do a one centimeter seam allowance. But I'm doing this the the um I'm doing the I'm doing this the fail safe way. So do it foot width first and then we're going to pin on the other yoke and sew that with a one centimeter seam allowance. So let's look at this again. Yoke comes over here with a seam allowance facing in and that seam allowance faces in as well. And now I'm doing something really silly. I'm grabbing it not from the neck hole, but I'm grabbing it from the side, which has a much smaller hole. Silly me. Anyway, the technique remains the same. Whichever end you grab first, you need to pull the other end through. The first thing I would do is put a pin in there so you know that can't go anywhere and then pull the other one through and pin it and it's a one centimeter all the way across now. And that way we make sure that that initial stitch line absolutely is not seen. Now, if both of them are centimeter, what are the chances that one of them is like a little bit off and then reveals the other one? So if you do the first stitch closer to the edge, you have no problem. So our next step is now to iron this, of course, nice and flat. And now we can top stitch this again with my triple stitch. And we're going again slightly off the edge there. Don't go too close to the edge. Um, when you're making stuff for boys or men, it just looks very girly if you're too close. So good distance from there. So it makes it look a bit, little bit more sporty. Now this top collar we're doing here, mine, is in the same fabric and on the other shirt I'm also doing in this, I'm doing it so the contrast fabric sits on top. So whichever you have, 
you just need to make sure that you reduce your stitch length in the corners and then it cannot fray and then we're going to sew this in and you can use um, foot width seam allowance here I always do it's kind of I want to do a centimeter I've worked it out for a centimeter and then I end up doing foot width so here you can see me making the stitch length smaller and then I make it longer again until I get to the other side and there I make it smaller again so then you go all the way down and then I'm changing my stitch length again So now I cut it back a bit and that is simply because we need the volume reduced because it has to fit in that small little corner there when I turn it. So cut it back. And then turn it and take a pin and work from the side forcing the top out a little bit more and then once you've got a good shape you can iron that and that's top stitch if you pull out too much you can also ease it back in with your pin so if you get a nose like that for example i want to show you a little trick so that the collar lies perfectly round what you need to do is fold the collar over so that you have got the curve in it kind of that lies around the neck and then we're going to shift that up by about two millimeters and pin it and that will guarantee that it likes, lies really round and the fabric you shimmy up is the one that hasn't got the violin on it that's important and if you're working with a contrast it'll be the shell fabric that's shimmied up because the violin will be on the contrast fabric i'm going to place the center back of the upper collar on the center back of the color stand and then I'm going to pin that on and that will automatically come to the right position but you should still check that the front is the same on both sides just in case you've made a mistake have a quick check is it the same yes it is and we can carry on now we're going to stitch this in with a holding stitch so you're gonna go less than foot width even you just really don't want the stitch to be seen by accident you know later on because we do the same as we just did before we're going to have another stitch over this so you need to make sure that you stitch closer to the edge all the way along and the collar is in and you can already see it coming together here now we're going to put the collar straight onto the shirt this is a method that is easier than putting the collar together first because you haven't got that much material and anyone that uh, wants to try it even differently could put the collar stand on before you even put the upper collar on that also works i do it both ways and if, actually to be honest if i do it i usually put the collar stand on first and then the collar afterwards because you have less fabric to handle and you can really see what you're doing and the key here is to just put the collar in all the way across and it will be a little bit round I don't know if you've noticed this but when you're making a shirt if you have made a shirt before most patterns are in a way that the collar stands up far too straight and it's too far away from the neckline this collar really comes in so it fits really nicely and um, so in order to do that of course the collar stand is rounded so it's a little bit harder to get it in so really pin this well and in fact I put in lots of vertical pins as well before I started I thought Nana I put them in this way then it can't move so you just go straight across and that's why I like this you take your centimeter seam allowance and it's just straight all I have to concentrate on is to not get any pleats underneath it so you need to continuously lift it and make sure that these little pleats that form underneath it are moved towards the back so you're coming round um, that's not very easy so if you have never made a shirt before you really have to take your time here and the likelihood of you getting a little pleat and having to redo some little bits is very high so don't knock yourself if you do that just unpick the little bits and do it again 
And again, I have speeded up this footage. You can see it when my hands are moving, it's speeded up. And then you see the sewing machine and you think, oh, that's still slow. It's not fast. This takes time. I hate unpicking. I rather do it slowly and meticulously, and then there's no unpicking. That's so much better, I think. Anyway. <laughs> Make sure this is really straight. Yeah, that line needs to be straight. Don't let this pull around. And look at that. I mean, there's not a little pleat in there. I was actually quite chuffed with that. <laughs> so now, next step, we need to iron this into the collar stand. really push it in there. I've done that now so it lies really flat and at this point I also want to cut it back. Because I'm using this really thick fabric I'm cutting back my contrast. You don't necessarily have to cut back anything here if you're using a lightweight fabric. Now we're going to put the collar stand on and with the right sides facing it just goes underneath the outside collar really and it's so easy because all you have to do now is so straight up from there and you can see that line the other bit is folded up so that makes so much more sense than the fiddly part of creating the collar first and then trying to get it on you always have that little bit of space where it kind of overlaps I don't know if you know what I mean it's it kind of like sticks out a bit and it's not entirely flat And also I've reduced the stitch length when I come down the curves so that it looks really nice and neat and I can cut it back. So it just comes straight up here and I would also recommend that if you're doing this for the first time, do mark that curve with a pencil so that it comes out the same on both sides. Um, I can, you know, move my foot around. Obviously I've made many, many shirts, um, but if you haven't, I would definitely use a pencil line. It took me years to get like the curve right first time without, you know, having to unpick anything. And still sometimes I have to go over and say, oh, but this is not quite the same. It might be straight, but they don't look the same. So draw a little line. And then with a one centimeter seam allowance, we go all the way around. Collar is quite slim as well. It's not a really tall collar. Um, I think that always gives it a bit of a homemade um, sort of board pattern look and we don't want that. So do take that centimeter seam allowance. You don't want that collar stand to be too high. So now we're coming around the corner again. And I make sure that when I hit that seam allowance, it is totally straight by that point. And you can see I'm still way off there and a beginner would now start to fret and think, oh no, it's not going to be, you know, it's going to be too, too steep. But it isn't, so a pencil line would be a really good idea and then stitch right next to that line and it's perfect. You can't really go wrong, can you? Well, maybe I suppose you can. And that uh, little holding stitch is well covered. Now I'm going to cut this back, but make sure that you don't cut back the contrast or the other side of the collar because we're going to turn that in and it makes it really difficult if you cut it too short. So now we're going to cut it off three millimeters, left standing about, you know. Just enough so that it can't fray and on the other side don't forget don't cut that off and then snip it that bit. so now we can turn in the collar obviously it needs pressing first <laughs> 
Ironing is a really important part of sewing. If you iron well, you find things are so much easier to stitch. And I forgot the top stitching there. I always do. So the better thing would have been, of course, make the top collar and then top stitch it. But of course, I didn't. And well, you can do it now. It doesn't really matter. Turn in that seam allowance over the other seam allowance. And then you can pin that. Now, when we are pinning all of this in, it's quite important that turn it in and that it just sits on the stitch line, just a little bit less. Because we're using a top stitch that is pretty wide, um, it would be really, really big, that line. Otherwise, that hangs out. And you'll see it once I'm done. I'm going to show you that, of course, as well, that it sits just on there. Make sure you get it in nice and flat. You have to work a bit there along the curve. That's not so easy, so take your time. But I think if you're making a shirt like this and it's like you've spent the money on the fabric, you've got a really nice pattern here, then you want it to look like so good, like all the um, big designer names so that people say, where did you get that shirt? Not, oh, did you make that yourself? So take your time. And I guarantee you this will look like a designer shirt because it is. It took me so much time to develop this pattern. Uh, I started last year and um, wasn't quite happy with it. Reworked it and now reworked it for another three weeks. So, well, mind you, the editing takes a long time, but it is a very nice pattern. I'm actually thinking it's one of my better ones. I really love it. Maybe I just say that because it's the one I've just done because I get excited about all my pans and then um, I get excited about the next one. Anyway, we're going to sew this in now from the outside and we're going to start stitching around from that end. And of course, I have to do this first. And we're stitching from underneath there simply because obviously it's not seen. Um, it disappears when the collar's done. Now, when you're doing the upper collar make sure that you do it from the inside because don't forget it rolls to the outside so and don't think i don't make mistakes because i started this and i was halfway through with the collar and i realized i was stop stitching it from the wrong side and i thought oh man you are silly sometimes so i had to unpick this triple stitch which was no fun and um, do it again so when you're working with a contrast fabric it's very obvious because you can see the stripe or the contrast um, showing. Don't go too far into the corners because you think you have to. Make sure that you keep that distance. It transports a lot easier if the machine has something to grab onto. I will also secure that stitch. And now I can go from the outside. So from the middle. Never start on the other side, simply because if you're right-handed, you want to have the fabric that you're stitching on always to the left, so that your eye can be on the right side of your presser foot to move things around. You want to try it the other way around. It's so hard for a um, right-handed person. If you're left-handed, actually start on the other side, because for you, you will be looking naturally the other way. So what I mean by the other side is, of course, the seam that's um, at the neckline. So take your time going round there. And that stitch line should line up with the stitch line that you have going down the placket. Then you are a pro. <laughs> really hold it. You might have to pull it a bit. You've got a lot of seam allowance in there, even if you cut it back. And then after a few stitches, the machine will grab it really nicely as well. Otherwise, it might get stuck on the edge and you have got these, these tiny little stitches and the machine just hammers in the same place and that's really annoying. I've just taken the pin out as well, but only literally once I'm on it because I don't want the line on the top to be interfered with by the pin. Sometimes it doesn't look that tidy then. You can leave the pins in, especially if... Um, they don't have this little hubble that they create, but sometimes they do, and so it's better to take them out. When you're literally on them, just pull them out. 
and again here I have to pull to make it transport and this is a good sewing machine most sewing machines you'll have to help it out even the really good ones like this fluff so we're going to where we started secure your thread and the collar is in and that my friends is not that difficult to do not when you do it like this You can give your collar a slight press as well, but don't put the iron down, just the steam and then hold it down with your hands. And now you can see how lovely that just covers it. If I'd had this out more, it would be just too thick. Now we're going to come to the sleeve. I know you've all been waiting for this one. It is a really cool technique and it's nothing to be frightened of. So you've got your pattern for the slip thing there. It's a long one. Um, and you have to cut it in half and then we iron over from the top and from either side and I'm using about seven mil here but actually I'm just going by the stripe it is all worked out for a centimeter but it doesn't have to be a centimeter whatever feels right here between five millimeters and a centimeter is absolutely fine and we're also going to do the cuff here and I have cut away my pattern to the dashed line so now I can fold this over and I have got a little bit of a template to make sure that both sides are exactly the same and the width of this is actually important so I would do it like that I wouldn't just guess because you might not get the right width. On the other one the little stripey one it can be slimmer it doesn't make any odds, but this really can't be slimmer. So you do need to use a pattern template, sorry. And then you move them on top of each other. Good sharp press. Yeah, we can do the top. Now you can just fold it straight over, do the slight slant or do what I do, a 90 degree angle here. It doesn't matter, whatever you like best. I like it with a really massive peak. <laughs> Don't know if that's even very nice, but I like it. So. Give it an iron from the outside as well it's got to be really sharp lots of steam here lots of heat and the important thing is that the stripy part is slimmer otherwise it, you'll get into trouble when you put this on now put the stripy part with the ironed over end right underneath the small end of the slit you see the shorter end there we go put it under And then all we have to do is pin this in and then the other bit can roll over the top and we put the other side on there you go triple stitch maybe secure that one as well and now we're going to take the other side of the cup and we just put that one in and it's not necessary to fold the upper part in because it's covered anyway and it would be really thick. So there is another little video which shows this individually as well where I do that. So there is more than one way to row. And again, you can see why it needed to be slimmer because we are going to stitch down here. And what we didn't want to do was to catch the little um, stripey fabric underneath it. So pin it on the side can move it out just to be sure and I'm going to triple stitch all of this down and then where I get to this point here I just catch it and if you're not sure that you're going to uh, know where that is put a pin in and then we're going to stitch across from that point and do a little cross again So first I move the underneath out, anyone knows what these things are called in English, please let me know. I call it a gentleman's cut. So again, take your time here and then when you get to the top you can move that bit back under and straighten it all out. It won't have caught it anyway, but it's just 
Better safe than sorry, I always think. Make sure that your needle is down when you turn. And make sure it's straight because you very easily get a little bit of, um, um, not a pleat, but um, extra length in there. And then it doesn't lie entirely flat. And of course, I'm not showing you this, but I did have that on a shirt as well. So um, it's very easily done. You need to make sure that this lies really, really flat. If you can't quite get there, and it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I don't think you would even see it if you inspected my shirts. But of course, when you're starting to be like a real perfectionist, you know, you see all your little mistakes. So we're sewing straight across from here. And then add an angle into the other corner. Ta-da! I love this. It is so simple. If you've got the right pattern that shows you exactly, you know, the right width and everything, and it works, and you, you do it like this, it's such an easy technique. And I'm also using this technique on the kitty cat dress because it is quite simple, but I didn't explain it very well on that video. So um, <laughs> this is going to be the one that people have to refer to when they're doing that part. And from the inside, it looks really clean as well. And you can see how it covers that rough edge from the outside. You didn't really need to turn that in. Now we're going to do our sleeve, put a gather thread in all the way around the top. The reason I'm doing this is because it makes it easier to put in. We're not actually going to gather anything, of course. We're just going to make sure that it sits nice and round. So make sure it's a one centimeter seam allowance that you're stitching the largest stitch available on your sewing machine. And then you pull the under thread so that you can hold in the top of the sleeve a bit. Now on the sleeve, you've got all these notches that you've put in, which will then line up with the notches in the sleeve. So make sure that you've got the right sleeve there. And here we go. We're going to pin this in from snip to snip. And people that are maybe not for the first shirt, but if you are one of these ladies that is making stuff with my patterns to sell, then you very likely will just work with the snips after a while because you know they're in the right position. So because it does take time to pin things in and with more experience, you can just use the snips. That's why I did them. Um, if it wasn't for you guys sewing my stuff, I wouldn't have put them in because that took ages to get them in the right position. Every time I thought I had them right and I did another sample, I thought, oh no, they're not right. I have to do them again. So back to the drawing board. So I hope you really appreciate um, that little bit that makes it so much easier just rather than giving you the center at the top and stuff. So make sure you get it all in and then we're ready to sew the sleeve in. Sewing a sleeve in is also not the easiest of all tasks, especially if it's a sleeve like this, which really is very fitted. It's not one that hangs over. I do take my time with the pinning um, to do it really nicely, but then when it's in, it will sit beautifully. It's so, so nice. And then we can top stitch it either to the inside, which is a little bit harder, or on the sleeve, or in fact, not top stitch at all. When you're stitching in your sleeve, it's very important that you do very small steps at a time, and then with the needle down, you move the um, sleeve around a bit. You can also, of course, help yourself with a little needle. Sometimes the fabric pushes, so then you hold it in place with that pin and also you need to make sure that the fabric doesn't pull over the shoulder head because it will want to do that. It needs to be edge to edge from one side to the other side. Now I've sewn this in, you can now iron this 
into the shirt, but we first of all have to overlock it. And I'm also going to cut off a little bit while I'm overlocking it. Make sure that it's really flat round there. If you're uncertain that you're not going to cut into anything, people get really scared of using the overlocker there. Disable the knife and cut it back a little bit before you start overlocking. Just a tiny bit now. I don't cut off much. In fact, I probably cut off a little bit too much on this one. Hmm. Don't want to sew into your actual seam. I mean, I'm really close to it there, but it's okay. Now you can iron it in or out. I'm going to iron it towards the shirt because that looks, I think, the most professional. Most shirts are done like that. And I'm going to triple stitch it all the way around. If you are doing a shirt for an older boy, you might want to also then top stitch it um, just with foot width again. That looks really nice. Make sure that the seam allowance remains towards the shirt. That's not how the seam allowance wants to sit. This is why we have to cut it back because the longer the seam allowance, the more resistance is there because you've got a smaller space going into a bigger space. If you're having a fabric that has a slight stretch in it, actually the sleeves will be a breeze. If you have a fabric like I do here, which is more like um, which is more like a jacket fabric, then it's harder. On this one, I've actually top stitched into the sleeve. That's my other example. I'm not a great fan of that. I prefer it onto the other side. Now we're going to put the sleeve together and that's so easy. All you have to do is pin it from one end to the other. So I always put a pin at the bottom, pin on the underarm, pin at the end of the sleeve and then with a one centimeter seam allowance I put this together. Then I'm going to overlock it. Again I cut a little bit off because I am going to top stitch my side seam and you could top stitch all the way down to the sleeve if you dare. I did it for the bigger shirts. Honestly for the little shirts no way I could get in there um, without hassle and I didn't want that. So I am the seam towards the back and then just top stitch to the underarm and that's I think totally fine. Now I'm going to put the cuff on and the nice thing is because we have got a pleat that we can adjust if the cuff didn't, didn't quite fit because everyone will put on the um, slit finish slightly different so you might be a couple of millimeters out, you might be a couple of millimeters, you know, shorter or wider, and you can adjust that in the pleat. But if you've done it exactly like I do here, it will fit on perfectly. So just go all the way around, pin it. And where you have the pleat, where you have the seam, sometimes it's a good idea to also pin that down so that when you are sewing, you are not going to have it flip over to the other side. So I'm going to put a pin there to avoid that. And then you need to turn your sleeve because you always want to work from the inside. It's just massively difficult to do it the other way around. So place this under the sewing machine like that and then just move it round as you go. And I hope you can still see it because it's such a small shirt I'm doing. I do it to so save fabric as well, you know. Plus my model, my little model from Texas, hello. <laughs> Um, is um, only a small boy, so I wanted to have that fit in. Go straight across. So it's the same technique that we've already used 
We are just going to, now that we've got the outside cuff on, put the inside cuff over the top. It's much, much easier than preparing the cuffs before. The first thing here is to really iron the seam into the cuff, very sharp edge. So do this right. And then you, same as on the collar, you place the contrast or the same fabric underneath it go all the way around make sure that you have a smaller stitch when you go and do your round parts because we're going to really cut that back and that you come down dead straight right next to the line here i'm sorry i didn't show more of that because um, i just thought i'd pressed record and i hadn't now i'm going to cut this back to make sure that I can, um, you know, turn it. Otherwise there's too much fabric. And we do the same as on the collar. Um, you just need to leave a little bit standing of the contrast, or basically the inside fabric, because of course we're going to turn that around the other seam allowance and fold it in. And if we can't do that because it's cut down too much, then that's not a good idea, is it? So now it's going to be pressed and then the same way as on the collar, we turn it in and we pin it. And we pin it so that the stitch line is just visible. Exactly the same as on the, on the collar. It's very important you press this really well before you start pinning. And I've done that here already. So that'll take some time, but it does look so, so good when it's done well. And now we're going to top stitch all the way around there and again have your actual shirt into the sewing machine you start on what is more difficult actually but then as you go around of course the shirt moves around as well and then it's easier so again if you start on the other side because you think that's easier um, you would be sadly mistaken so start this way so that your fabric remains on the left hand side and your eye is on the right because for a right-handed person that is the edge of the fabric that's where my concentration has to be on and you can see i still move the pins out even though i don't have to i just want a really nice and even seam for all those close-up photographs and footage don't want to show myself up do I <laughs> so secure and you've got a really lovely cuff now that isn't very difficult it's just a lot of steps that you need to follow and you need to do them really nicely do not be too lazy to go to your ironing board you need to iron all the way now we're going to turn in the hem and because we're going to put a little tab on before we turn it all like I've shown you there, we're going to make sure that the tab is in the right position and that it's easy to turn. So the best way to do this is to put a few tiny little snips into that curve. Bear in mind that your curve isn't as extreme as this. I've changed that after I've made the shirt, cut back the seam allowance a bit. So now when we've put the tab on, so the right side of the tab here will face the wrong side of your shirt look like that sounds more complicated than it is and then when i turn this up i catch it there we go and now i pin it in now, people that have been sewing for a long time, they will not pin this, they'll just do it. But I guarantee you that if this is like your first or second time doing this, you need to pin it. Um, because when you've got a curve, the curve needs to be actually held in. And I also would like to say that the same technique that we used for the pocket, where we got the round really nice, if you find this too hard to get round the round bits, just put a gather thread in on the edge of the fabric, pull it a bit, and it'll come in perfectly. So that's the other thing that you can do to get this round really well done. Um, I'm going to show you this here, how much fabric I have to actually hold in 
The good news is that when you have a curve, you've also got the bias and you can hold it in. But if you start pulling it, um, then as soon as you get to the straight line, you'll have a pleat. You know what I mean? At the bottom there, you've got it straight and that will then start pleating. So I've pinned this all painstakingly and now I'm going to top stitch it, not with the triple stitch because the triple stitch has, of course, a much nicer side on the um, outside. So I'm stitching from the inside. So I really don't want that to be seen on the other side because it's not that nice. So I'm stitching with a usual standard stitch and I've made it longer 3.5 or three is probably right. And then I'm stitching very close to the edge. And when you get to the tab, make sure that you have everything folded in that slightly snipped, otherwise, of course, it'll fray. And as you go around the curve, it's easy to slip off. So don't fret if you do, because you can see it. I'm doing it now, right now, right now, oh, stepped off. Just move your machine back and, and go over it. I haven't even unpicked that part. I just leave it no one sees it honestly these little things that sometimes you get hung up on when you're sewing when the actual whole bit is finished you don't even see it it's just you that sees it because you have been sewing it and you know where your little mistakes are and two weeks down the road you have forgotten you've made this mistake and you won't even see it yourself yes Anyway, help yourself with a pin if it starts to like, oh, it wants to pleat, you know, just hold it down with that little pin. And now we can put the tab in. And again, here I do use the triple stitch. You take that tab, roll it to the outside, and then we're going to triple stitch it from one side to the other. Ta-da, to the tip, back down. Are you still there? This is a long video, 60 minutes. <laughs> This is the die hard of all videos, this is. So now I'm going to stitch this. I'm going to make sure that this has come out a little bit. See, and I don't do anything again. I just tuck it in and put a pin there. Come on, it's on the inside. Who's going to see it? So I'm actually locking in this stitch as well, even though it's a triple stitch. Needle down, go up to your tip. And turn and go down again. I love tabs and those things. They are good for nothing. They have no function whatsoever, but they look good. And maybe they keep it from ripping if somebody holds onto you shirt um, little boys will hold on to each other's shirts but apart from that now then we're going to put the buttonholes in people are always a little bit scared of buttonholes and they're right to be scared because some machines don't do them so well and there are a few tricks to do it right so i'm going to show you how how this is done on my electronic machine So first I mark down a centimeter from the top so I know where I have to mark them. Bearing in mind you don't have to use my marks. You can put the buttons anywhere you like that you think is good. I would make sure that the top button on the plucket is about two and a half tops, three centimeters from the top. And then I'm going to put a pin in at the end of my buttonhole because most electronic machines work backwards and so you don't mark the beginning but you mark the end. If you have a mechanical machine you can of course do it the other way around. Now I'm also going to measure the distance between my stitching lines and that's in my case 2.5 and then I divide that by 2. Now I don't actually need to do that in writing but anyway <laughs> it's 1.25 so you find half of that because optically that's where you need to be so if you've gone a little bit further over with your top stitching still make sure that you're in the center between those so now i'm going to mark it with a pencil there are a lot of gadget things that i really like but all of mine are in storage so if you haven't got anything else use a pencil not um 
pen that's uh, yeah, erasable, just use a pencil, come on. Nobody's going to see it and it washes out. I wouldn't use Taylor's chalk because the mark is not, um, you know, to the point enough. Unless you've got a little Taylor's chalk pencil, that really works well as well. But make sure it's a white one because if you use a yellow one, that might not even wash out. I've had that and that's really annoying. So I mark all of those and then I can take all my pins out and the top one needs to be two millimeters over from where you've got the ones on the placket. And again, that's central. Now put your button into the back of your foot. I have to say that on a lot of sewing machines, the button will come out hugely bigger than it needs to be. So check your buttonhole first on some scrap fabric. If you're using a puff machine, I'm absolutely in love with this now because it's a perfect buttonhole every time. Put the needle down exactly where your dot is. Make sure that the edge of the buttonhole foot is parallel with your stitching line or the line of the placket there and then just let it do its thing. Now the sensor on the side which has these arrows, every time you touch it it will actually disable it. So I've just done that now and what would happen here is it wouldn't even stitch a whole button wall, it probably only go halfway. So what I do when I'm not sure whether I touched it, I will turn off the machine and turn it back on and reset it because there's nothing worse than unstitching a button wall. So you can see me do that here. And then I just let the machine do its thing and it comes out perfect so I do I do really like this. I was a little bit scared of using this I was so used to my mechanical puff and now I think it's great but the sensor is annoying I have to say so it's best to have the fabric on the right hand side so it's nowhere near the sensor it can't be avoided though unfortunately for the top part and other things but then you have to really hold the fabric down and I'm going to show you those as well so that you get a really good idea of how I do it at home and get round nags in the automatic button hauler. There we go. Last one, make sure it's right on the button. There. Straighten it out, take your time. Nothing worse than your button hauler not being in the right position. And now I'm going to do the top one. And here you can see that I hold the fabric down. I do not want that collar to touch my sensor. In fact, it did on the first thing. I maybe should have put this in the video, but it would have been just too long if I left all this in. But my sensor went off and I had to unpick it. Now for your cuff, you actually want to start from um, the back going forwards again. So I have to measure where the front is and that's 1.5 centimeters over that's usually a good measurement and then I just put my buttonhole that I've done on so I can see how big it is and I mark that and this time on the one cuff I have to have the fabric on the left hand side and so I'm really holding it again you can see it to make sure that the sensor is not compromised and on the other side it's a little bit easier I just have to hold it steady come back on myself and my button holes are complete and you can breathe a sigh of relief <laughs> so now we're going to cut them open you can use a quick unpick I tend to use my scissor but to make a start for the button or the quick unpick truly is the safest option and then I use my scissor to cut into the corners and check your button. Yay! Puff is great. I mean, I sing my praises all the time, but really once you've had a puff, you never go back to anything else. I'm going to get lots of comments now saying, no, my Husqvarna, mind you know me, I love them. I'm sure you do. It's all right. I just like my puff. We can all like our sewing machines. So now when I put my button on, make sure that you go right in the corner for the cuff, then go straight through. And I'm going to put my button on and the key to a really nicely put on button is to put your thumbnail underneath the button while you stitch it in. That will make sure 
that it's not tight because if it's tight it's hard to do up and also it doesn't look very nice this way you've got a little bit of a gap and in that gap the other side of the cuff which you close where the buttonhole is will fit in and it'll almost like lie flat on top there will be no pressure so that's what you want and you don't need gadgets for that they just get in the way just use your nail if you haven't got a nail come on use your whole thumb no need to pay money for these gadgets. I've seen them in YouTube videos and I'm thinking, why would people buy this? So anyway, I put another knot in my thread, of course, double thread, always to put the buttons on. And I'm ready to now put my buttons onto the front. And here it's slightly different. You don't go right in the top corner, but you go a little bit lower down. So about two to three millimeters off the top, not the middle of it, just a little bit down. Um, if you are too uh, high, it will make it all a little bit too tight. So you need to have some movement room for your buttons. So that's it. Also, what I want to say, you can see that the button here goes on um, possibly like a little bit more over to the left rather than sitting right on the center so that the placket doesn't show. Now how industry gets around this is that on the left side of a man's shirt they very often have a slimmer placket or they haven't got placket at all they just turn the fabric in. You can of course um, if you decide after watching this yeah I'll do that I do the nice placket on one side and then I just do it flash on the other you can just turn the fabric in as you would normally and then top stitch it from the outside so that the placket does not peep out from the underneath that's an option you can just do that. I didn't do it on these shirts because I think it does work like this I can cover it and if you open it up I think it looks really cool to have the placket on both sides. So carry on putting the buttons on. And then the top button, we go again right into the corner. So it's all done up. And now I make sure that it sits nice. And then I go right in the corner and I go all the way down and then I put the button on in exactly the same way again, secure it. And that's it. Hooray. <laughs> you can also put buttons on the tabs, of course. So I hope you really enjoyed watching this. I know it was a horrendously long video, but I do show everything in detail. And maybe that enables you to make a product just as beautiful as this. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. And don't forget, you can go to my project page and find out more and can see some more small little videos that show you variations. Thank you very much, guys. Bye.